Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our 12th uh, National Orthopedic uh, Webinar. And uh, we've got uh, three presentations today. And um, the focus is on our recovery of orthopedics and how technology may be able to help us in to scale up the orthopedic recovery. The numbers that are coming forward regarding waiting lists are horrific. Um, so I won't even go there, but there is an expectation that we will have patients on waiting lists for several years. Um, this webinar is being recorded and is available to our members after 24 hours. All the participants are on mute. Um, we'll have three presentations. Then towards the end, at about a quarter to two, we'll have questions. We may have questions in between. We will have a few poll questions that will be posed by some of our presenters. If there's any technical issues, if you could uh, please use the chat function. Thank you. Um, so now my slide will not advance. Let me try it. There we go. So um, just a little news update. Good news is things are opening up. Our numbers are low in the UK. We're going to be having to have a pint of beer soon and, and eat um, our chips inside a restaurant instead of out in the cold. And the biggest issue around at the moment and the topical issue is about these patients that are on the waiting list, how we're going to deal with them, how we're going to identify harms review. Uh, the British Orthopaedic Association have produced some guidelines published this week. Uh, lots of work to do, but the overlying um, emphasis is on our duty of care to those patients while they're on these waiting lists. Um, on the downside, we're still concerned about Indian variants, what's going to happen in the future. And it's almost certain that we will all need a top-up vaccine in the autumn. Mm -hmm. Um, this was an excellent presentation organized through the BOA yesterday, chaired by Bob Hanley, the president of the BOA, and it was um, mentioning a lot of the issues um, that we might be talking about, how do we manage recovery, but most importantly, how we support patients. Uh, I believe this has been recorded and should be available to BO mem BOA members uh, on the website. Um, I found it very, very useful, lots of tips and tricks, but a huge amount of work where the work is going to come from and who's going to do the work is, is going to be an ongoing discussion. Um, uh, just to be very, very clear, we've got three presenters. They do represent different companies um, and that the National Orthopaedic Alliance do not endorse any of these companies or have any financial interests. And uh, finally, just to introduce our speakers, we start off with Nathan Moore, who's a trainee from the Southwest, and he's gonna talk about ortho pathway and how that might help us. Followed by Sandeep um, from Definition Help, also a consultant orthopedic surgeon of some years experience, a bit like myself. And then followed by Mark Roaband and Robert Bamart, who will talk to us about consent wise. We've asked for a maximum of 15 minutes. Um, there'll be some poll questions in between and then questions at the end. So on that note, I will ask Nathan, please, if you could share your screen, Nathan. I will stop sharing, okay? And if you could uh, introduce yourself and crack on, that'd be very nice, thank you. Absolutely. Can everyone see my screen and hear me at the moment? That looks good. Very good. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm uh, Nathan Moore. I'm a, a Southwest trainee, ST6, currently on an out-of-program experience. And I founded a software company to try and help us deliver on the NHS long-term plan. A lot of the um, issues we've addressed designing this years ago are definitely relevant now. I'm also a clinical safety officer and a web software engineer and on the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur Programme. So I'm going to talk to you today about Ortho Pathway, which is our solution for orthopaedics. We're supported by NHS England and NHS Improvement via SBRI Healthcare, which is the innovation arm of NHS England. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is just explain what the software is, um, explain the challenges we're trying to, uh, to meet, 
bit about our story, how the solution developed, the solution itself, and some case studies. Any questions as we go along, please put them in the Q&A. So what is Orthopathway? So it's essentially a cloud platform for building, sharing, and deploying optimized consultant-led um, virtual consultant pathways. So it's designed to standardize musculoskeletal services locally, regionally, and nationally. It's an efficiency play at scale. It distributes national guidance combined with local expert knowledge into the core workflow of the NHS frontline staff. It's device agnostic. It's important in the NHS that um, software works on any device, mobile devices, iPads, PCs, and Macs, interoperable between systems. Clinical governance is at the center of the app's functionality and development. Mm -hmm. It's also it could be seen as an interactive, editable orthopedic electronic textbook. It's um, fully illustrated with hundreds of medical illustrations. And because it's digital, that actually works as an audit research and operations intelligence tool. So what does it achieve? We've managed to deploy at five NHS trusts since we launched 10 months ago. Um, every MSK presentation is filtered through a, a dynamic um, virtual consultant pathway. This can result in reducing fracture clinic by up to 50% and elective clinics by up to 70% just by applying best practice right into the core workflow. Um, staff can then be redeployed to man more elective theatres to cope with a post-COVID surge, which we all know is a mountain we've got to deal with, um, and standardised consultant-led pathways of care for every injury. And we've currently got a health economic assessment funded by NHS England underway across these five trusts, um, suggesting preliminary data of £100 saving per patient if you actually apply best practice for every patient. Um, we won a competition in July 2020. NHS England uh, put out a competition for solutions to reduce demand on emergency departments and reduce the length of stay in the emergency departments with efficient triage and discharge. Discharge. We tick all these boxes, so we we're fortunate enough to win that competition or phase one of it. So, what were the challenges that really led to this before COVID 19, which carry over to now? So, we all know there's a broad variation in clinical practice between trusts and individuals. There's misinterpretation of, of guidance. There's also difficulty implementing best practice. Our emergency departments are very, very busy, it's only getting busier. Our fractional and elective clinics are very busy, often overbooked, and patients are sometimes referred that don't need to be, and this adds to delays in getting to those patients where we can make a difference with. And sometimes patients are giving advice in first presentation that then conflicts with subsequent advice in clinic. Sometimes you have to deconstruct advice like you need an operation, and actually, potentially, the patient doesn't necessarily need one. So what are the new challenges due to COVID? Well, unsurprisingly, the same as before COVID, just made a lot worse. We've got increased demand on trauma and elective services with a limited increase in resources of staff, theatres and beds. And we're already behind by 12 months of elective operating. So we've got to make a really big efficiency play. So what's the goal? The goal is to make for patients to receive the best treatment first time in the right place with optimal use of NHS resources. The aim is to improve service delivery, clinical effectiveness, and cost effective effectiveness. It's an efficiency play. So we all talk about outside the box thinking, but there's always a box. We've always got barriers to what you can or can't do. Any solution has to be clinically effective, most importantly, cost effective and feasible. But we operate within a much smaller box in our day-to-day -day practice. And what we need to do is expand the horizon and go into the space of what's possible. And that's what, that's what we've tried to do. So the NHS long-term plan knows about this and backs it up. So here are three references from the NHS long-term plan from section five on the digital transformation. So this was years ago when the NHS long-term plan was written, they wanted decision support to help um, clinicians apply best practice, redesign clinical pathways, and before COVID to reduce face-to-face -face appointments by a third. This is becoming more than just a goal to, to strive towards, we have to do it. So we all know what clinical effectiveness, we're all clinicians, but it's the application of clinical experience, all that research that's done to get optimum processes out for care of our, for our patients. So what do we have so far guidance-wise? So we've got, we've got great guidance from the BOA. The base guidelines are known word for word by every ST3 going for an interview. Um, does everyone that sees the patients on the front line know they exist and use them um, every time they see a patient? 
Not necessarily. We've also got the Blue Book, Society Guidance, NICE Guidance, Local Trust Guidelines. There isn't a guideline for every injury and there's no one size fits all. So our story really started with an audit actually. We actually compared current practice at a trust with um, those 12 guidance. And this is about a year and a half after it came out. We found that half of stable injuries were placed non work growing in a plaster that could have been uh, put into a walking boot and potentially discharged. Another half of the, of the patients with uncertain stability didn't have a weight bearing x-ray and were placed in a plaster, more missed opportunities. So we um, produced a poster, like most audit interventions, we've got a poster in Fracture Clinic, we're going to change our practice and make everything much better, broadly dividing Weber B's into stable, uncertain and unstable. And we thought we did a good job, put it on the wall. Um, like all posters, people don't always look at them, they always engage. Uh, I don't think the poster survived the revamp of Fracture Clinic, actually. Um, so if you look at this poster, actually, I think it's a step in the easier to digest direction than a page document, but it requires a lot of knowledge to really digest and understand it. So you need to know what Taylor Shift is. You probably need a picture there. Um, and it doesn't actually cover all of ankle fractures. It covers Weber B, right? So if you wanted to actually cover every variant of ankle fracture, whether it's open or closed, you need a much more complex flow chart but then if you make it really complex, it can be hard to navigate. So this is actually a comprehensive um, flow chart for ankle fractures. And this is what happens behind the scenes in ortho pathway. Um, but you can see that this is quite complex, not the best way to show information to an end user. So we take, we've got the complexity sorted for this complex decision making. So let's simplify it for the end users. And this takes us on to the application itself. So through an interface that's pretty intuitive to use, the start of every pathway starts with where are you? Are you in the minor injury unit, emergency department, fracture clinic, follow-up clinic? We cover every point in the patient journey and take the end user who's a healthcare professional through every step. And we break down these complex problems into the smallest recursive steps, give the end user every, all the information they need from national guidance and best practice given to them in manageable chunks. And as they navigate sort of a best practice pathway, all their decisions are logged. And when they reach the end of a pathway, um, that, usage, that becomes the referral template for onwards referral management to VFC, or if you don't have a VFC, to Fracture Clinic. So you'll see here, once the VTE assessment is completed, um, you get the option to print out the summary, um, or it can be sent to any EPR or um, emailed onto the next step. And we thought this was a good, a good improvement, like we're actually getting right into the core workflow best practice. But then we thought, let's go beyond ankles and let's just do everything. Let's just do all, all trauma and elective. So that's what we did. Um, so uh, let's move on from that. So there's a case study. So Cornwall Partnership NHS Trust consists of 10 minor injury units that all face three different um, secondary care trusts. And you can imagine with the difference and variation of practice and opinion, even at senior levels, it's quite hard for the minor injury nurses to know what to do with patient X when they get conflicting advice from different um, secondary care centres. So what they did manage to do over the past sort of 10 months is standardise 90 clinical pathways. We've got 140 available, we've done 90 so far. And where variation in practice has been found, when you have to put that into a pathway, it makes it look a bit silly whenever you're doing different things at different secondary care centres. So it creates a, a reason for senior leaders at each site to talk to come to together and just standardise their practice and then deploy it uh, in real time, which has been great to see. So we've part of our health economic assessment as commissioned by NHS England informed the qualitative feedback from staff. And it was really positive to find that they actually found the information clear, they found it intuitive to use, um, gave, empowered them to make decisions themselves and you know, potentially reducing the burden on the on-call team. So, one, one, one half of the side effects, I would say, of making the whole pathway of care for every injury really efficient is it has massive cost saving implications. So Professor Fordham and his health economic team have, have, are currently undergoing this uh, budget impact analysis, cost utility and cost consequence analysis on various pathways across these trusts. And I've been given permission today to share the preliminary results of the ankle fracture pathway, which you just saw. And by just applying best practice, you can save over hundred pounds per patient um, that has an ankle fracture. I mean, that's just applying the both guidance and a bit extra in a meaningful way that can be measured and implemented. So if you imagine all that research and uh, guidance that are made, it takes you on a marathon almost all the way 
but unless it's delivered in a meaningful way in the core workflow to that MIU nurse or ED doctor seeing the patient, it doesn't have the same impact. So we provide that last little step to get that impact. There's socioeconomic effects too. So the NHS is one of its major goals over the next 10 years is delivering net zero carbon. So we can reduce outpatient appointments that are unnecessary by 50% or more, we're reducing CO2 emission. For the patients, reduced time off work, reduced travel costs and higher quality of, of care is all achievable. Um, mm -hmm. North Devon, another one of our case studies, um, they found that they could reduce fracture clinic with um, a proportion of the pathways deployed by 20%, and they're anticipating reducing fracture clinic to 40% with full deployment. Mm -hmm. And this was published at ASSET uh, and Journal of Surgery a few months ago. They've also managed to standardize their carpal tunnel syndrome pathways as well to reduce their outpatient appointments by 70%. So how is it deployed? So when a trust gets access to the, to the platform, they can import pathways from any other trust in the network. We believe in not reinventing the wheel at every site. We can import a pathway, edit it within the uh, editing suite, uh, review your pathways. Everything's completely adaptable to local requirements. You can access our image gallery, uh, you can request more illustrations from us if we haven't got the, what, what you want. Um, review them. They have to be signed off by multiple consultants and engagement with emergency department leads as well. Um, they're deployed. We've got a post-market surveillance built into the application where at, within every pathway, any end user can raise an issue at any time. That's logs and an email sent to the, to the local editors. So you've got that, that safety feedback for clinical risk management. And then it's all once once a pathway is deployed, it can be redeployed at any time or updated. And we've got tiered user accounts with uh, security and permissions that mean only, only the right people can do that. Um, so here's a bit we talk about audit research and operations intelligence. So because this is digital, every interaction with every pathway can be measured. So this gives us uh, data on usage data, so distribution of trauma over time and elective presentations, trends in usage. You can also query the data for audits. So a new guidance comes, guidance comes out from BOAST. Um, you deploy the new, new guidance, and then you can extract data to see what effect that has had on your patients um, in real time. You can also link changes to the pathways, the patient reported outcome measures, and perhaps potentially do research projects. So in summary, um, improve clinical effectiveness, improve efficiency, standardize care, and secondary staff education benefits as they learn to think like your experts. This is all powered by our cross cover engine, our in-house um, pathway building engine. As, as I said, mentioned before, we're supported by the HSN, NHS England, um, NHS Improvement, and we've got a range of products that cover almost every other surgical specialty uh, in, in various stages of development. Um, if, if you'd like us to help you with your COVID recovery plan, please email us, contact us, um, and thanks very much for listening. I look forward to questions. That's great, Nathan. Thank you very much. Uh, my first question is, there's not an awful lot about elective orthopedics, which is where the real problem is um, for hip and knee pathways. Have you got a hip replacement pathway and a knee replacement pathway to make these referrals more appropriate? So what we do, we do have hip and knee developed. We also have them for uh, follow up. So one of the major burdens was actually seeing patients back in the specialist consultant clinics post-op. Um, they don't necessarily need to be seen by the consultants. We've got entire pathways that um, associate healthcare professionals will go through with a combination of the Oxford scores um, and looking at an x-ray to decide at the, at the one year, three year follow up for arthroplasty, does this patient uh, trigger any response that needs to be seen in clinic or not to try and reduce that burden. Um, and as I mentioned already, we've got the carpal tunnel syndrome pathway that can reduce the sort of, instead of having you know, patient coming in for a neurophysiology assessment and coming in to see the consultant. They basically have all that done before they arrive and see the surgeon on day of surgery with everything pre-packaged. Didn't quite have time today to go into all the elective pathways, but we, we are covering uh, pretty much everything. Yeah. Okay, Nathan. And finally, don't forget about your orthopedic career. As a trainer, I'm worried about you already. But anyway, <laughs> thank you for that, Nathan. We'll go on to Sandeep if you want to share your screen. Um, thank you. Uh, great. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, that looks good. Thank you, Sandy. 
Great stuff. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to talk at the webinar. My name is Sandeep Chan, I'm a consultant speaker surgeon down in Brighton. I'm one of the 2021 NHS and I National Innovation Fellows, which I come to and founder of Definition Health. Um, obviously, we've all had a, a pretty tough year um, going forward um, with uh, COVID. Obviously, the world's changed a lot for us as surgeons, proning patients wearing these uh, FFP3 masks. But for society, it has changed a lot as well. So the advent of Zoom uh, and Amazon and technologies, uh, more and more the general population now use digital technologies in a day-to-day -day life than ever before. If you translate that into what's happening to us in surgery, as Cormac quite rightly said, we have a tsunami of patients that are going to hit us who are waiting for the surgery. The numbers are huge. We know our surgeries could become more complicated uh, as the college survey shows. And we know from this brilliant study from Impact, uh, the effect that waiting on waiting lists is having on patients as a whole, as the waiting lists rise. However, before you jump into a digital matrix or digital technology, I'd ask you to think about a few things that we have to think about quite hard in the NIA and NHS. Uh, the first is digital poverty. So the national population uh, from, uh, in the UK, 21% from the Cambridge studies live in digital poverty. So that means that they can't access digital uh, uh, tools uh, via internet or via uh, um, any other means. They don't have the equipment to do it or they just don't want to do it. And that has the risk of producing health inequalities in that population, you can't access it. And when we jump into digital technology, we need to make sure that what we're using has some evidence of benefit because COVID has brought around a lot of digital technologies which don't have benefit. And from a systems point of view, you really need some joined up thinking and not silo solutions or have those silo solutions linked together uh, so they're not all acting as one. So we developed the first uh, UK's first end-to-end -end digital platform for surgery. Um, it was uh, founded by uh, two co-founders and has 11 NHS consultants, nurses, physios and the core development team. We've had feedback for over 1,000 healthcare professionals and 18,000 patients and it's used in 10 hospitals with lots of patients registered and it's on various national frameworks. Probably most importantly is the award of our National Innovation Fellowship this year, which was themed on three key themes. Uh, one was the response to COVID and we were the only surgical company chosen to help hospitals recover from COVID uh, by Stephen Powers, uh, who's the NHS Medical Director and uh, Amanda Pritchard, who's a COO. Um, and it really is about helping hospitals recover from recover their surgical services, as Cormac uh, quite rightly pointed out earlier on. Because restarting surgery is going to be more than just putting a patient on the operating list uh, and getting them into theatre. It's about effective communication with patients, properly assessing those patients on waiting lists. So not some random text message that says, do you still want your operation? It's actually assessing those patients and delivering your education now. That's why the patients are waiting now. We know we can't operate on every single patient, but we can still educate them. Many of you won't be aware that the Centre of Perioperative Care was set up between the Joint Colleges of the College of Surgeons and College of Anesthetists and Scarlett McNally is the surgical director on that. And her theme around optimising fitness for surgery is really, really important. While these patients are waiting, we could be optimising their fitness for surgery, which will have a positive physiological effect on them uh, after their surgery. And likewise, the whole process of consent preparation can start now. Obviously, the GMC guidance in November uh, 2020 means patients need to understand what they're having done and the risks. Signing a form is no longer good enough. And lastly, obviously, is our outcome assessments. So we developed a platform which started way before COVID, um, and it has three key elements, a secure virtual clinic, uh, a patient assessment form recovery, and it follows the NHS internet first policy, which means clinicians can access it from anywhere, so they don't need to be sitting within their own trust, it has secure logging uh, profiles. So we're all really excited by secure virtual clinics, obviously, um, in, in video consultations. But we launched in Brighton the first N uh, fracture clinic that was virtual uh, about nine years ago from one of my colleagues, James Gibbs. Um, we won an NHS award for it. And what we learned from it is we know that face to face, most patients only take away about 30 percent of information that we tell them. Well, virtually it's worse. So actually what we needed to do was to have a mechanism where we could send and receive information from patients. So whether you do your call face-to-face, uh, -face, virtually or via video, the key thing is the patient is linked to you as a hospital. 
so that if you as a patient want to send your hospital a picture of your wound or your range of motion or anything to do with your care, you can send it to the hospital and the hospital will be alerted. And actually at the bottom here, either the doctor, the nurse or the physio can actually send you information back. So you have true outpatient MDT care. If you come to surgery, the key is around your assessment. And assessments are not just around the pre-assessment questionnaire. They're around the questionnaire the preparation of patient properly via video education and assessments and surveys, whether it be PROMs, QPROMs or otherwise. So patients complete their healthcare questionnaire uh, via chapters of their health and they get copies of this. And then most importantly, they watch procedure specific videos around their anesthetic, their procedure and actually their consent process. So these are conditioning videos. They don't take away the relationship between the surgeon and the patient, which is really, really important, but they start preparing the patient for their consent. And what's most important is that actually having watched the video, and this is in the Arthroscopy video, they have to confirm that they've watched and understood the video or that they have questions. And the onus at this point falls back into the hospital. What's really important is we scientifically prove this. We presented the data from this at the BOA, which showed high patient satisfaction rates versus EDO forms, which was the gold standard. And that's not a criticism of EDO forms. I think EDO forms are really, really good, but they're written information. And what you need to understand is the, there was a study in the JBGS which showed that written information, the average age in orthopedics of written information is 16 years old. Our national reading age is only 12. So even if patients keep the piece of paper and read it, very few understand it. So that's the bit about information retention. So what video does, and it's not rocket science, is it helps people understand the risks and benefits of surgery and anesthesia. We also, interestingly as a side effect, started defending lots of complaints because actually when patients watch the video, we can tell you where, how, and how many times they've watched a video. And actually, hospitals can recount that to patients who then complain that they weren't told about a particular complications, for example. And most importantly, when patients go home, we need to continue their recovery. So this may not be important necessarily in your mind, but you need to remember that over a million patients each year are readmitted to hospitals in the UK 30 days after discharge, or sorry, within 30 days of discharge, that costs the NHS 2.6 billion pounds. They're the numbers from the National Audit Office. So when the patient goes home, they can self-report their conditions and how they're progressing, variables such as pain, mood, sleep. They can send us wound pictures, uh, and this gets alerted to a hospital via smart dashboards. So it increases recovery, it increases patient satisfaction, and it starts reducing uh, costs that we know that occur. Hospitals have live dashboards uh, going forward, so they have smart tools in which they can monitor patients, and it changes digitally workflow. And it changes workflow for the patient and the surgeons, going from the first traditional visit on the left-hand side of the screen right through to the post-surgical follow-up by using a digital tool, by digitally transforming the pathway. And what's really important is that this doesn't mean you have to use a digital tool. The tool is just there for the surgical and nursing teams to use to help them on their process. Will it be from that first consultation right through to the perioperative care in the center, right through to their uh, follow-up? And what's really important, it could be integrated with EMRs and EPRs. And one of the big problems with EMRs and EPRs like CERN and EPIC, and we can see this in, in places like Newcastle and Oxford and the Royal Free, is they have no patient-facing tool. So patients cannot deliver information into the system and you can't deliver patient out of the system, uh, sorry, effective information out of the system to patients such as recovery screens. When you extend that out into the ICS uh, world, what it effectively means is that actually in the top left of this diagram, when a patient comes into an ICS, then they can use the same tool whether they're following the conservative route at the top or whether they drop into the surgical route in the middle and bottom. And most importantly, when they recover or join the recovery phase, whichever pathway they're in, you have a single tool. And therefore that tool follows the patient and the ICS from their community setting into their secondary setting, which is really important for continuity of care. So what about case studies? Vikington's a really interesting one um, because this, what, this enabled, what we enabled them to do was to give them a tool and use their staff who have all the knowledge as do all our departments to do their job as they need to do it. So this started after the first wave of COVID, we were asked to go in uh, and Neil and Patel and Ravi, their key anesthetists asked us to get involved. And they assessed four or 500 of their patients using just their admin team in four weeks, using their screen, so their shielding pe uh, nurses who are sitting at home. It effectively changed their model of care, which used to be face-to-face -face pre assessments for, for patients and essentially became telephone assessments. 
what was interesting is that because the tool early risk stratifies patients, they're able to reduce their high risk anesthetic clinics from 10 to two because they have effective sight of the patient's risks. And now effectively, they've got a backlist of fully assessed patients about 1200. And what it essentially does is in this diagram is takes patients on the left hand side of this screen, which means that whether you're on an existing waiting list or just being put on the waiting list by a surgeon like myself, all that, all that has to happen is the admin team interact with you on the left hand side. And what happens is that the patients complete their information at home. They watch their education videos at home, surrounded by their friends, family, or, or otherwise their carers who have the same information. And this is hugely impactful in aftercare because patients' relatives know what they're going to uh, have and understand the outcomes afterwards. In the middle of this diagram, the patients can then have their assessments done, uh, whether that be telephone, face-to-face, -face, and the process basically changes by front-loading all the information that hospitals receive. So it makes it far more time efficient for hospitals. So it means that centres like Swaleok, you know, had about 1,400 patients assessed over the COVID period. It was quite remarkable. Right in about 600 patients. The hospital St John Elizabeth at the bottom was interesting. It's not an orthopedic hospital, but it was interesting because it took cancer patients from four different London trusts and didn't have to bring them into hospital. They could all be remotely assessed. And what effectively enables us to do during our recovery, during this dreadful time, is to take entire waiting lists because all you have to do is have an admin person go through the waiting list and register people on the system. And, the health, and then the onus is on the patient to deliver their information to the hospital in the center of this diagram. And at that point, when the hospital is ready, it's recovered, then either the senior PRA nurses or the anesthetist or the surgeon can start doing their health assessment and stratify those patients into healthy patients who are ready for surgery, non-healthy patients, or actually patients who may need a conversation about their risk. The key is, you can communicate with all those patients, all of them on the waiting list. So at Wrightington, we sent out information packs to all the patients on their waiting list, which contain their physio prehab, getting fit for surgery, their isolation advice, all of them, whether they're coming in for surgery the next day or in several months from now. And it saves a colossal amount of money, as well as a few forests. Patient satisfaction scores are really high. Patients love doing it this way. We all think that patients want to come into our pre-assessment clinics. They don't. They actually, a lot of them want to stay at home. They're busy. And actually, from a hospital point of view, there's a huge value proposition. So the KSS um, uh, Academic Science Network did a lot of work for, around this for us, uh, around accurately coding patient comorbidity and sequins. We know from the big US studies about joint replacement, if you failed comor uh, so if you failed to identify 10 key comorbidities in joint replacements, then you can add about $3,000 of inpatient costs onto each case. Cost savings around efficiency gains and identifying comorbidities, patients like the net promoter scores, and you have reduced hospital attendances and carbon footprints, et cetera. It's obvious that a surgeon like myself is gonna sell it to you, but most importantly, NHSX have published this on their casebook study. So basically what it showed using, they looked at Swayok, was we saved Swayok about 3,000 patient appointments. And we saved about 94,000 pounds. Now I have to be careful when I say we, because actually all we actually did was gave Swayok and Bipal and Mary Richardson and their team the tool that they were smart enough to understand how they wanted to use it that suited their practice. And they really have transformed how they uh, look at their patients and actually assess their patients and actually uh, the pre-care and aftercare. And using SWAP as a model, actually it means that whether it be a hospital or an ICS, it doesn't matter any longer geographically where you are. So obviously SWAP takes patients from George's, Kingston, Epsom, Croydon, et cetera. It doesn't matter where that patient comes from because digitally the patient's delivering that information into the center and actually it made SWAP the fastest recovering elective center in London. So us by doing our jobs as clinicians, standardizing care, and this is the PQIP pathway, which the Palpative Programme wants us to follow, which we actually started following over two years ago, we're delivering comorbidities and optimizing care, which generates coding. And coding, smart coding, generates income for lots of hospitals. So in summary briefly, patient-facing tools, which I've just described to you, are really the direction of travel where health economies are going. Um, and don't be constrained by big EMRs, EPRs, because essentially you cannot deliver patient-facing tools uh, via them. Uh, and that's what the health service is um, driving towards. Uh, and that way you avoid big capital outlays. And the one other thing I'd, I'd emphasize as our last speaker did is make sure you have evidence. Lots of people are coming around uh, saying, well, you should use our digital tool because it's digital and it's sexy, but is there actual evidence of benefit? Thank you.
Uh, that's really good, Sandeep. You talk very fast, a bit like me. Well done. <laughs> um, so a um, few quick questions. You talk about standardized care. You, you never get two knee surgeons to have a standardized post-operative care for their patients. Um, there's a great variation among care pathways about what people want and do, their indications for surgery. How is that resolved in this software? So basically, the recovery part is, well, let's start with the pre, uh, the clinic part. You, Cormac, uh, can send out whatever information about your pathway you want for the patient. And my pathway may be completely different. I can send out my information. Okay. So that's the variable part that you as a unit or a surgeon can have, and you can upload your videos or your information. Okay. The key part of the standardized part, for example, is a health assessment. That's based on national guidance. So national thoracic side guidance, cardiology association guidance, so everybody, nobody misses an atrial fibrillation how to treat it. Nobody misses a heart failure how to treat it. And then the recovery phase, again, can be customized to you. So basically, I showed you a generic recovery pathway uh, description in that slide. It can be customized to knee replacement, hip replacement, shoulder arthroscopy, whatever, whatever you decide to do. So GERFT are really, really interested in this, as I said. Um, so Tim is really interested in this particular, as are Chris Known, who's the GERF perioperative lead uh, for medicine, because it standardizes that perioperative part in particular, as well as obviously the recovery and the uh, clinic part. Okay, thank you very much. And I presume it rolls out to things like upper limb, shoulder replacements or everything. It's got a bit of everything in it. It has absolutely everything in it, and it doesn't just cover orthopedics, it covers all of surgery, which is why um, the NHS are, want us to scale it throughout um, the UK. So that's what the NHS NIA fellowship is about, is they've picked technology that they want to scale to help hospitals recover. So at the end of all this, we'll be talking, there'll be some questions and, and to everybody about costs. Um, I don't want to answer that now, but how, how do we pay for all of this? So uh, thanks uh, for, for being very efficient, uh, Sandy. I'm going to move on now, if that's okay, and invite Mark Robb and then Robin Bamworth, hopefully he's managed to join us, and to talk to us a bit about um, consent-wise. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's Mark Robin here. Um, Robin's actually in... He's managed to dial in from North, the north of Scotland. He's on holiday there, so um, he has managed to log in. So I'm hoping that he can drive this presentation forward. Robin, are you there? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me now, guys? Yes. Can okay, that, we can hear both of you. That's good. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I'm uh, in a very remote part of Scotland doing some hill walking, but I've managed to join you via a satellite link. So uh, thanks for having us. Um, I, I, can I just confirm that the slides are running there? Yes, yeah. we, have, we have slides up. Um, if you want to advance and then we'll know if it runs. Great. So good afternoon and thanks for this opportunity to allow ConsentWise to share our vision on the future of digital consent in a modern healthcare setting. We believe our platform could help meet your challenge of using technology to scale up orthopedic recovery. I will now present the problem, our solution, demo the software in action through a series of short videos, and then wrap up with our fee model. Uh, next slide, please. Go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, sure. Okay, we're there, Thanks. thank you. Thank you, Ian. Lovely. So, we're sure you're all aware of the current consenting process and some of the problems that exist. To put this in context, it affected over 5 million patients in 2014 in England alone. This is data from the Health and Social Care Information Centre, now known as NHS Digital. It's fairly obvious that these numbers will have increased a great deal and will continue to do so. This is a direct impact on paper leaflet and form production and printing as well as the ongoing management of consent clinics. Although not directly relevant to today's topic, we also know that litigation against the NHS has increased following the landmark Montgomery versus Lanarkshire Health Board case, and that litigation costs the NHS in the region of two and a half billion pounds each year. Next slide, please. 
Consent-wise solution is based on an in-depth understanding of the problem. Our digital team worked closely with NHS Scotland and a panel of eight surgical experts in the Glasgow region, along with their teams, to get to grips with the current challenges. The redesigned service offers a completely digital approach that uses a familiar GovUK style web interface. Patients will find it as simple as taxing their vehicle online. We are confident that we can offer patients and healthcare teams a solution that focuses on the principles of digitization, collaboration and unification. Next slide. There are many benefits to using ConsentWise and it is useful to break this down across our user groups. Patients will find the platform simple to use and based on the principles of e-learning. We provide a safe digital space where they can read information at their own pace, ask questions of medics and share with their family. Medical teams will find the admin area intuitive and focused on two key tasks, quickly creating new digital consents and new digital information packs, which comprise one or many information leaflets. NHS trusts and boards will find that costs and time to consent is reduced while patient experience and access to data for insights is improved. Next slide. So our approach is to transform the entire process, not simply digitize existing paper forms. Our web-based platform doesn't rely on time-consuming software installations for patients or healthcare teams. Our focus on security testing demonstrates our commitment to quality. We are ISO 9001 and 27001 accredited, Cyber Essential certified, and have externally commissioned security testing. Our experienced digital team are happy to discuss technology solutions with your IT team. We offer distinct training sessions for medics, admins, and managers. What's more, because our platform has an open architecture, we can integrate with many existing systems. So, uh, sorry, next slide. Uh, sorry, if you could back up one. Oh. Sorry, Ian, could, could you just go back to the slide on our team, please? Oh, maybe that's missing from, from your deck. Anyway, I'll tell you briefly about our team. Um, in 2015, Mark Broadbent and his orthopaedic team in Glasgow were becoming increasingly frustrated with the consent process. They were spending valuable time locating and sharing often outdated patient information leaflets and carrying out related tasks. Losing both time and patience, he contacted me and the idea behind ConsentWise was born. Our technical lead, Stuart, offers a wealth of experience in digital solution architecture and software development including many other civic projects. Our extended team of creative, technical and medical resource are all really passionate about the platform. So next slide. Yeah, so I guess you all want to know what the platform actually looks like. So we have prepared a series of short screencasts to show you just that. So Ian, hopefully you can run the, the first one of these for us. And that's going to show you a patient accessing an information with it online. So they're in their email. They've received uh, an email with a link and they also receive a code by text. So it uses two factor authentication to make sure that's secure. And this is the interface we're talking about, which looks very like the, the, the Gov UK uh, interface. So the patients accessing information about a, a made up Procedure. Uh, this shows you that video can be embedded in there and notes from a doctor can be provided. A little bit about your surgeon and the patient simply saying, Yes, I've read and understood this, uh, rates the process and is able to download that for future reference.
that's in a PDF format, so that can be saved and shared. Uh, I think that's the end of that one, Ian. So if you could run the next one, please. This shows a patient completing the digital consent process, which is very similar. Basically, they receive an email, they click a link in the email, and they enter the code they've received by text. And they can access their consent information. So it shows the patient's details, the procedure details, and some information about the surgeon. They can then uh, access the detail of the procedure they're going to have, mark that as complete, uh, review the options. Oh, sorry, I, uh, I couldn't see that in the corner of my screen. It's also possible to ask questions of the, the clinician through the system, view the options, view the risks, and give consent. So the, the sort of information that's uh, provided there is configurable. They can provide a digital signature. And again, they can rate, rate that process or our feedback. So that's, the, that's how straightforward a, a consent is. So the next one is a, this is a medic logging into our system to create a consent. So they log in securely. They can access all sorts of information, but the focus here is on consents. Uh, first thing they do is fill out the details of the patient that they're consenting. So CHI number or, or uh, patient number or any other number that is used as a reference, the date of birth, their gender, and some contact details, mobile and email. Before moving on to the actual procedure information. So can I just ask a so, thing there, Robin? Um, to say it's quite important they all realise this is kind of real time filling in these forms. One of the questions you always get is, well, how much will this add on to the consultation? How, how, how much time will it add on to all the effort involved around this? But you can actually see it doesn't take long because you've pre-populated all these consent forms and patient information leaflets in advance. So it doesn't take particularly long here. No, the whole, whole process takes under two minutes if you have uh, preloaded, as Mark says, the, the information about the procedure. And all of that information can be saved and then edited throughout the process. So this, this screen here shows you the summary of information that's been completed and the fact that you can uh, save that and then just send that to, to the patient. So that goes off to their email address. Um, obviously ties into the, the patient interface that we saw a minute ago. So the final video we have here is a, an administrator creating a digital information pack. I think, unfortunately, we are running the same video again. Um, I wonder, Ian, is it possible to find that fourth video or shall we just move on yeah here we go so that's the this is the administrator uh view so basically the scenario here is that sub part of the, the medics uh, healthcare team, the support role. So they're logging in and seeing far less information. All they're doing is sending information about an upcoming procedure to a patient. So they're filling out uh, the relevant details about that patient and then selecting one or more information leaflets. So they're choosing the medic, 
they may have more than one medic in their team. And again, the system caters for all of that. Uh, they might fill in some notes that are specific to that patient, save the pack and send it off. So that ties in with the review we had earlier, the patient reviewing information he puts online. So thanks Ian <laughs> for your support there. So if we could go back to the, yeah, back to the slideshow. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, um, Cormac had asked us to provide some information about pricing. So we have uh, two options around pricing to provide flexibility. Uh, we have a model which is focused around uh, those with budgets that are based on capital expenditure and one for departments or trusts that have a focus on operational expenditure. Um, our objective really is to just provide the most um, sensible option and not put up any barriers. Our, the main difference is that our so annual software license fee has a higher uh, initial investment, but can allow for unlimited users, whereas the OPEX model is more about, uh, the focus is more on the number of users, so bums on seats, if you like. And we think that the capital expenditure model is best for trust-wide purchasing or large teams, and the OPEX model is better for small smaller teams or departments who are maybe just looking to try out the software initially. Um, so, okay, thank you, Robin. Yeah. Uh, can you put the numbers on that? Yeah, I'm just going to say that. Annual yeah. license, 25 grand. Numbers, like. yes. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's right. So the, the, with the CapEx model, the idea is that we spend some time implementing the system. We think 10, in the region of 10 days, an annual license fee, and then a per transaction fee. So that's each um, leaflet or consent that is processed through our system. So on average of uh, per annum, that might come out at 35K. Uh, next slide, please. The operational uh, model is one where uh, there's no annual software license fee and pricing is based on the number of users. So Okay, and just very briefly, who, who, who pays the money out? Is it the trust? Or is it the ICS or the STP? Who who pays for the who pays for this? Well, in our experience, it's the trust that pays okay. for it. Yeah. That's fine. I, okay. It'll be here. In well, thank you very much. I'm going to go some some questions now. Um, if you could, um, if you could stop sharing your screen, please, and we could put the presenters and let them share their screens. Would that be fine? Thank you. So we have a question here. Um, sorry, what is this here? Oh, this is a poll, is it? Oh, sorry. Question time. Sorry. Um, sorry, I I've lost. No, I found it again, sorry. Could the virtual fracture clinic software be replicated for a virtual ward round, for example, in the environment that the elective surgical pathway is on a separate site? Uh, anybody, I don't know where that is probably for Nathan, I think, is it Nathan? Yeah, so I, I mean, a, a component of our platform enables the streamlining of virtual fracture clinics. It's essentially, a decision support flow chart generator for any number of pathways. So it's very adaptable to many different scenarios and you'd work with our team to deliver exactly what you want. Um, in terms of virtual ward round, I'll have to scope out that question to know exactly what you mean. Um, but you could in theory build a pathway for your juniors to follow at that other site that is a safe and documented best practice for your patients um, before discharge. So in that context, it's very doable. Um, it may be worth a separate conversation to delve into that in more detail. Yeah, if there is a separate conversation on the 
uh, NOA website will have some contact details for all the presenters if you want to contact them separately, which I'm sure you will do if you're interested in, in these products. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, has any of the panel got questions for the other panel members? Because there seems to be a little bit of crossover between uh, stuff, especially in re relationship to uh, information and consent. If any of the other panel members have any questions. Um, could I ask then, Nathan, tell me about pricing for author pathway, who pays for it? A ballpark figure for money involved. Okay, um, yeah, well, okay. So we um, actually have contractual agreement with NHS England where we can't charge anything beyond what is deemed fair market rate. And that fair market rate, uh, it all depends more in terms of cost savings. So we've got this big economic analysis going on. And before it's finished, I can't give a definitive final pricing, but it's going to be, it varies depending on, it's trust that pay. And they can get a tariff from the CCG to pay for it because a saving in one trust as a budget silo may save money further up the chain. So it's actually the CCG or STP that saves money overall. Um, in terms of sort of ballpark figures, a trust that has four minor injury units versus one that's got 10 and four sites is different usages. So we tend to think about it in terms of how much is used. The final pricing is fixed annually for a, for a trust based on their number of pathway episodes they're going to have. So in terms of the cost savings, the cost is almost negligible. Can we uh, have the numbers, so, please, Nathan? So in terms of it's going to be sort of ballpark, maybe around about 25,000 for a year's license for a trust and all its minor injury units. So this is the sort of, when we talk about technology and software, this is the sort of number that's bandied around very commonly in that same region, um, which is interesting. Because also pathway is not about the trust because a lot of the pathways start outside secondary care trusts. Absolutely. Um, so I'm presuming you're when you say trust, you're talking about some primary care trusts as well. Um, yeah, abs absolutely. So yeah. Maybe a, a division, divi a divvy up between primary care trusts and possibly secondary care, maybe something like that. No, absolutely. I mean, what happens down in Devon and Cornwall is that uh, one of our first sort of customers went to the STP and presented it and the STP then provided funds to everyone yes. underneath their control because it's all those individual budget silos. It's not in my interest in budget silo A to yeah. save money in B. So, so it's yeah. about in this thing. new world of ICS, I think that's the way things are going. It's going to be an ICS um, approval, an ICS payment. I think that's probably the way it goes. Same question to you, Sandy. Who, who pays and how much? So at the moment, the trust pay, um, individual trust pay, um, a thousand patients is about five thousand pounds. So it's less than the cost of a hip replacement to get a thousand patients through. So it's relatively cost effective. Uh, I mentioned obviously um, the NHSX study uh, at Swellyock. That ninety-six thousand pounds we saved included uh, that was on top of the cost of the system. So that's true cost releasing benefit. Certainly speaking to Tim Briggs and Chris Snowden, uh, yeah, the, the move towards ICS is, uh, it will be a central, I guess it will be a central procurement by uh, the ICSs. Obviously most ICSs, although they're just about getting their legal entity, haven't quite got their procurement routes right. But for example, NHS England are procuring through uh, yeah, G Cloud 12 as our, yeah, we're just about, we just um, agreed contracts with Royal Epsom and, uh, uh, so Royal Miles and Epsom and Selenia. They're all going through G Cloud procurement because uh, GCAD and Sparks DPS, a government framework where everything's been pre approved. So there's transparency around cost and pricing. The key is we can't charge trust hundreds of thousands of pounds for capital upfront cost. It's just not sustainable. You know that, and I know that, Cormac, yeah. all the equipment we get in, which is outdated. So you've got to expect essentially a license fee that's cost effective where you can produce costs. And actually, what's really important, which I think if all the speakers, as well as myself, is in the NIA NHS uh, uh, awards, one of the key things is about workforce. We're going to really struggle with our workforce going forward. People are burnt out after COVID. We're not going to have the same amount of workforce we have. And therefore, we're going to have to use these digital tools to help support them. And that one of the things that we do is support those staff because it makes their job easier. Really. And that's yeah, well, I think the digital platforms that everything's out there and available it's just that many places do not adopt them for various different reasons 
And yeah. one of the issues in our trust is that we do not record email addresses. So um, communication with 80 year olds through email is, is, is not on. And uh, some of them have good support um, with their, their family, but some of them don't. So can we get through all these systems without recording email addresses? Uh, you probably can, although NHSX two-factor authentication is the gold standard. It usually requires an email address and a mobile phone uh, number or some, something similar, or you scan a barcode. The key is, um, when you talk about your age, I, I just caution you about that because there's lots of evidence that suggests age is no longer a barrier to di adoption of digital technology, is the first thing. Uh, obviously, we both get much older, is, a, is the first thing to say. But there is, whatever program you have, has to have what we call a digital assist pathway. So we have a digital assist pathway for people who don't, who can't use digital themselves. Okay. That is what's going to stop health inequalities and discrimination between people. And, and last last month at our webinar, we heard from Sweden where they do seemingly um, educate people much more than we do proactively, the elderly on digital platforms. I'm going to go straight to two questions. Linda Hutton asks the panel. Could you ask the panelists whether any of their options facilitate the journey from primary care to secondary care? For example, arthroplasty referrals. Yep, absolutely. So that's the whole point of that whole end-to-end -end journey. So the moment the patient's referred in, they can get their information, whether it be secondary care or primary care, who can then transition into secondary care if, if the need be arises, yeah. then transition back into primary care with the recovery module. Oh, I think on behalf of, of, of all three presenters, the answer is probably yes to that, yes. unless somebody wants to add anything extra. Uh, second question, how did you get involved in this QI projects and how could others get involved in similar, similar projects in the future? A little bit obtuse that one, but maybe, I think maybe, um, I don't know, maybe Nathan, how did you get involved instead of learning how to do orthopedic surgery? So I found a challenge or a problem that really gripped me. I, I saw that lots of audits were happening and people focus on beginning an audit and a resolution to get the points for whatever in their CV. But I was just absolutely focused on actually making the change. Um, and I, I went off and I spent a year and a half learning how to program. And I built the MVP, built a business, started getting out in use as soon as possible. Um, no, there wasn't really like a QI project that was this is attached to, I kind of just created it. Um, I am on the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur Scheme, which is brilliant for supporting entrepreneurs uh, led by Professor Tony Young. Um, it's sort of more of a mentorship type uh, community, peer-to-peer -peer support. support. Um, I recommend that to anyone. Who well, that's visits. something that we might visit actually at the NOA in the future. Claire, could you just write that down on our list of things to do? Um, it sounds a very exciting project. Um, we certainly, We'll try and find out a bit more about that. Um, any other answers to the question? Sandeep, how did you get involved? Um, I got involved purely because of the frustration, Cormac, of you know, having a list that where a patient gets cancelled and you can't fit it because there's yeah. nothing going on. And it, your, your coronary artery is going to spasm because your waiting list is a year long already. And you know, when people say, if only you could do this or if only you could do that, a group of us got together and said, well, we're fed up with the trust not doing anything, we're going to do it ourselves. So we started building it ourselves and one thing led on to another. I think Nathan's, uh, uh, the entrepreneurship is a great program run by Tony Kelly. Uh, and after that, there are other programs such as accelerated programs for people who are interested. And ultimately the National Innovation Fellowship um, is where you, know, yeah. where you go. So there's a clear pathway and more surgeons should get involved in it really. Lovely, thanks. Mark, how did you get involved? Yeah. Can I just answer a couple of questions as well? So. I've been using digital consent now for about seven or eight years. I presented the results of that uh, at the BOA about three or four years ago and how it integrates and how it works with the elderly population. Because one of the questions you had a minute ago was how does the elderly patient or the patient that doesn't have access to IT get involved with this sort of thing? Patients will still require to come to the pre-assessment clinic. So that's the first thing you have to realize. So even if they don't have access at home, the pre-assessment nurses can take them through the digital information within the hospital environment make sure they into, um, they're aware of that as well and they can also put them in touch with family members as well to help and because i've now been doing this for about you know six seven years i can see that the gradual improvement in, in response to most of these um emails that we send out certainly the, the whole covid situation has increased the use of 
IT digital information to most of the elderly population. So a lot of people are becoming engaged with this as well. So I think that's one thing to bear in mind. We can access this elderly population. Um, so um, just yeah. like what Nathan and Sandeep said, though, it, it, it's about finding a problem and trying to find some answer to, to make life easier for everybody, trying to improve the situation for all those involved. And uh, fi final question, Mark, if it's OK. I'm sorry to cut short because we're running a bit out of time. Tips, um, we'll, ask, we'll leave it with you, Mark. Tips for dragging your trust into the 21st century and getting them to adopt this new technology. Oh, I tell you, it's certainly um, it's a challenging time. Um, Glasgow, GGC is the biggest trust in the UK. So trying to move this is like moving the Titanic. That's for sure. It's actually the, the biggest problem we've got is with the e-health department, the IT department. It's allowing them to engage it's allowing us to engage with them with patient identifying information and that that's the most difficult part of it all the clinicians are all very keen to get involved the patients are but the it departments just seem incredibly stuck when it actually comes to you know opening up their systems because there seems to be arrangements arrangements with the bigger uh, companies like mediserve etc so it's very difficult so just keep poking at them that's basically the main the way forward. Same, same question to sandy Absolutely. IT, unfortunately, are usually your biggest problem because clinicians are happy. And once the finance department see the numbers of most digital technology, as Nathan's already pointed out, as is Matthew and ourselves, it's, 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 uh, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. But when you get IT involved, there seems to be um, an issue uh, usually in lots of things. So you need to engage with IT early and get somebody on your side? Uh, yep, and you need to explain to them about. Or can you buy? Can you bypass them? <laughs> <laughs> not, not usually. But actually, you have to gently educate them that national policy that they usually quote back off the legacy systems to you, and actually legacy systems have changed rapidly. Um, so it's quite interesting um, okay. how that conversation. Thank you, Nathan. Any tips and tricks? Yeah. So. You got absolutely win hearts and minds, uh, and it sounds cheesy, but you've got to just present, get get people on board. And when it came for me for the MVP version of this, it didn't interact with any patient details. So it basically, as soon as all the contracts are signed and the consultants deploy the pathways, IT just has to not block the site. There's nothing else they need to do. So that got it in through the front door. And then now that we're working on bespoke integrations for every hospital to work with their PaaS system or through the NHS PDS e referral APIs. It's all like an, we work agile, we add it to the platform. It's not essential to make it work from day one. So we can get it deployed like within a couple of days. Um, and then we can add on those IT integrations later because we're a clinician facing decision support app primarily. We're a bit different to the other guys. Um, so we don't have to have that integration with patient identifiable information. And to get around IT as well, you don't need to store any patient details in the cloud. You can store a hash number that represents a lookup table in their database in-house that's associated with their NHS numbers. So that can disarm a lot of people as well. You go, actually, we're not storing anything and it's all encrypted at rest. So the, the risks are very minimal. And as I think Mark said, the third party penetration tests are really important. Make sure your DTAC assessments are all done, all the in-house stuff IT is going to ask for. Just have it ready. And we didn't hear much about GDPR. I presume that's everybody. Somebody's got to tick all, take the call. Yeah, sure. Guardian has got to be involved and tick yeah, all those boxes. To come up with all the systems that you've just seen, they all have to be GDPR, GDPR compliant, secure. You can't get on frameworks without a huge, you know, a 20 page um, deeper form, which is technical and boring. Okay. That's a question. One other thing is quite important, which is actually senior clinicians need to back people who come in with a good solution. So if you believe in the solution, actually senior clinicians need to actually get this because it, it does affect patients and it does affect your practice as well in improving it. So a lot of these solutions around, which just from an internal push will happen because they're cost effective. Okay, look at, um, we're running out of time and thank you for all the presenters. I think Fallon, you're gonna pop up a final slide just about the NOA. So official thank you to everybody. These are the things that are happening, hopefully, over the next few months. Um, next month, we're going to concentrate on, on integrated care systems and pathways um, because we'll probably have to go to these integrated care systems and ICSs and the people there to look for the money to buy all these software bits of kit. 
Um, so we're going to have we're going to concentrate on that next month, and hopefully, um, there's other things there that will be of interest to you as well. Um, in the background, I want to thank everybody in the NOA um, who contributes on a monthly basis and on a regular basis to organising. So Fallon and Hoey in the background and Claire Harris, thank you for that. And on that note, lots of thank yous. Thank you for the participants for asking questions and being involved. And please, if you think we should do things differently or there's an area that should be covered, please contact the NOA through Claire Harris or any information you require, you'll see an email address at the bottom left hand side of your screen that you can contact the NOA. On that note, I'm just gonna close it down. Thank you very much everybody for joining and bye for now, have a good afternoon.